response that is three will be here at one o'clock on Wednesday. Wednesday? I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Oh, praise the Lord's name with me. Let us exalt God's name together. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the Lord's name is great among the nations. Joining hearts and spirits, let us worship God. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. 
Trusting in God's grace, I invite you to stand, if you're able, and let us confess our sin. Eternal God, in every age you have raised up men and women to live and die in faith. We confess that we are indifferent to your will. You call us to proclaim your name, but we are silent. You call us to do what is just, but we remain idle. You call us to live faithfully, but we are afraid. In your mercy, forgive us. Give us courage to follow in your way, that join with those from ages past who have served you with faith, hope, and love. We may inherit the kingdom you promised in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. For those of you joining us in person and for those of you joining us virtually, welcome. Um, I've been coming now since we've had in-person services, and I think this is the largest gathering in person that we've had in a while, and it's really good to see everyone here. I realize that not everyone can be with us physically, presently, so we're glad that we have the technology to allow people to join us remotely. Uh, I feel like everybody knows me by now, but uh, for those that could be new joining us remotely, my name is John Strange. Uh, I've been a member here for over 20 years, and I am a elder, although not actively serving, and a lifelong Presbyterian. I want to call your attention to uh, the announcements that we have in our, in our bulletins. Uh, there are several things going on, several opportunities to participate in our missions. Uh, the mission committee invites all to join them for a work day at Tri-State Food Bank um, on Saturday, November 7th. There's more information about that in the bulletin. Um, also, um, it's that time of year for Jiffy Mix, but uh, we're doing something a little different. Um, a lot of people may be hesitant to go out shopping, and, and of course, we all try to go around and find the best deal on Jiffy Mix. So uh, what we're being asked to do this year uh, is just kind of estimate what you would normally spend on the Jiffy Mix and perhaps write a check and uh, give that uh, donation. Um, there are several other things. I also was asked to let everyone know that uh, the funeral service celebrating the life of David Sponseller uh, will be here Wednesday at 1 p.m. If you're not able to join um, or can't join in person, I understand that's going to be live streamed. Uh, and also, if you do show up in person, of course, our normal precautions for uh, these days that we're living in, masks and social distancing apply. And last but certainly not least, we welcome back to our service today the Reverend Wendy McCormick. Um, I've um, known Wendy and served with her quite a bit as a liturgist, so welcome back. For those of you that don't know, uh, Wendy is Kevin's um, wife. And so, uh, as most of us know, I think by now that Kevin is enjoying a well-deserved, hopefully uh, enjoying a well-deserved sabbatical. I'm not a very proficient Facebooker, um, so I don't know where he is. Hopefully he knows where he is and all is going well. So, um, hello Kevin if you're, if you're watching. Um, is there anything else that maybe I need to mention in the life of our church. Okay, let us continue with our worship. Oh, I did fail to mention our 
Uh, Elder of the Week, it's, uh, his contact information is in our bulletin, or actually, you can look it up, but his name is Gary Morris. Let us continue with our worship. Let us pray that as we open the pages of Scripture, God will be present, inspiring our hearing and lead us, us, leading us into understanding. Guide us, O oh God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth we may find freedom, and in your love discover your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Must be the time change. Okay. Our first lesson today comes from Psalm 34. Please join me as we read responsively. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. And he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Good morning. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. I add my greetings to John's. 
Greetings to the saints in cyberspace. That's all of you who are worshiping on the couch. I have um, found a certain pleasure in that over these months. Um, it's also a, a wonderful privilege to be here among the saints gathered here in the sanctuary. A special shout out to young saints who got up early this morning to play bells. Beautiful music and really wonderful to hear the bells ringing in the space. I chose today one of the readings for All Saints Day. And if you take just a quick glance at it, you'll know that it is very, very familiar. Like the 23rd Psalm and certain passages of Shakespeare, some of these words are well known by believers and non-believers, churchgoers and non-churchgoers. The danger with something like that is we think we already know before we hear. So before we read it, lest these words just wash over us as overly familiar, I want to say a little bit about the context in which Matthew has placed these Beatitudes as they're known. Reverend Alan Hinton of Wyzetta, Minnesota pointed out that the first few chapters of Matthew, which include Jesus' genealogy, his birth story, the visit of the Magi, and the role of King Herod, elevate the expectation for readers and hearers of the traditionally politically powerful royal messiah. And then by the time readers and hearers turn the page to chapter 5 and these beginning words of the famous Sermon on the Mount, we are well primed in Reverend Hinton's words to expect a potent cross between David and Elijah who would roll Roman heads and or bring down the fire of God's judgment on sinners. Even though that was a long time ago, I invite you to consider the ways in which we may long for a particular type of political leader in our own time, and then listen afresh to these words as Jesus lays out for us his way, our way of participating in God's kingdom. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God bless our hearing and our understanding of the reading. This is an auspicious Sunday to take the pulpit. No matter who you voted for or plan to vote for, most all of us Americans are on edge these days. The division and polarization in our country, our community, and in some cases even our neighborhoods is unprecedented. It was barely a generation ago that a president of either political party nominated justices to the federal judiciary as well as the Supreme Court, and confirmation was a matter of course. A Supreme Court justice, whether nominated by a Republican or a Democratic president, was easily and unremarkably confirmed with 95 or 96 or even 100 votes in the Senate. Those days are long gone, it seems, with plenty of blame to go around, and now we have this thoroughly politicized judiciary, the only consideration being who wields power and whoever doesn't plotting for
for what they'll do when they wield it again. Younger Americans never did have faith in institutions the way many of us older folks do. And yet, for society to function, a certain amount of trust in certain institutions is necessary. Maybe some of you are like me when I say that it feels as if I stand now not on solid ground but on shifting sand. I never before wondered if I could trust elections, if I could trust government, if I could trust law enforcement, if I could trust the basic goodwill of my fellow citizens, but now I do. Today I worry not so much about the outcome of Tuesday's election as about everything else. Will the count be fair? Will people accept the results? Will we see protests turn to riots and looting and violence? Will those who are threatening vigilante justice actually take to the streets with their military armaments? Will we see long court battles that make the contested presidential election of 2000 look like child's play? Will we be unknowingly manipulated by misinformation and disinformation, even from foreign actors? Maybe your worries are like mine, or maybe they're different. We're all pretty anxious. The point is we're living in a troubled time when few of us feel the rock-solid trust in our institutions that we once did. Maybe citizenship has changed and maybe it hasn't, but something certainly feels very different. And so in recent days I have found myself envying the Christian faith of those who never could trust those institutions the way I did. Over the past weeks, in some matter-of-fact things with my job, I had the opportunity to sit with several small groups of black Christians in this community. Everyone's talking about the pandemic, one person said, but the pandemic of COVID is nothing compared to the pandemic of racism. Another person wondered why it's taken white Americans like me so long to see the outrage in police killings. Some of us woke up in a particular way this past summer at the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. But he asked, why didn't you believe us before? We've been telling you this is happening for so long. Do you remember Rodney King? What really struck me in these conversations, though, was that depth of Christian faith that these neighbors rely on. As black Americans, trusting the system will be fair and that institutions are reliable has never for them been a sure thing. Trusting their vote will count, trusting the goodwill of their neighbors, trusting an even playing field has never been a sure thing. Their sure thing is Jesus. Their sure thing is the wellspring of the scriptures and faith in God. And so, unlike me, confused and a little disillusioned about my now shaky faith in American institutions, these black American Christian friends are 100% crystal clear about where their faith lies. And I'm embarrassed to say I felt envious. So when I read that the Beatitudes are about the nature of citizenship, in the words of Reverend Tim Beach Verhey of Face on North Carolina, it really caught my attention. They're about the nature of citizenship. So on this All Saints Day, I'm wanting to dig deep into what it means for us to be citizens of the kingdom in this life, in this life. And I want to wonder how I might lean into my citizenship as a child of God and how that must shape the nature of my citizenship in this country. As you know, each of Jesus' sayings begins with the word blessed or blessed. Many translate the Greek as fortunate or happy. Not happy as opposed to sad, but more happy as opposed to empty or dissatisfied. But another take might be one of the Hebrew words for blessed, ashar, which literally means to find the right road. So consider this. Instead of happy or, or blessed are the poor in spirit, that is the humble, how about you are on the right road when you are poor in spirit, humble. 
You are on the right road when you mourn, when the pain of the world touches you deeply. You are on the right road when you are meek and lacking in worldly power and all of its trappings and temptations. You are on the right road when you deeply hunger and thirst and long for what's right. You are on the right road when you are merciful, when you are guided more by mercy than by judgment and vengeance. You are on the right road when your heart is pure, when you seek to make peace. You are on the right road. And even you are on the right road when you are persecuted for doing what's right, when you are treated badly for standing for what's right. You are on the right road. You are fortunate. You are blessed. Why? The grammatical genius of this passage is the combination of present and future tense. You are blessed. You are on the right road because of what will be. You will be part of the kingdom of heaven. You will be comforted. You will inherit the earth. Your thirst for what is right will be satisfied. You show mercy and you will receive mercy. You will see God. You will see God. You will be children of God. Indeed, this is where our trust must lie. This is the nature of our citizenship. To use the language of this day, happy are you, blessed are you, you are on the right road when you live into your life and calling as a saint, as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, because you will be one with all the saints who now live eternally with God. You will be part of God's kingdom, which we glimpse, we taste, only in part in this life, but we will one day fully live. This is the nature of our citizenship in the family of God, in the communion of saints, to lean into humility, mourning, meekness, hunger and thirst for what is right, to choose mercy and purity of heart and the ways of making peace, not because it's easy, not even because it's rewarded, but because it's what God is like. It's what Jesus came to show us. And in the end, it is the only true, fulfilling, life-giving way that there is. As we lean into this way, as we renew our commitment to our citizenship in the kingdom of God, as we double down on humility and mercy, on mourning with all who mourn, especially those who have died at the hands of great injustice, as we never, ever give up on the quest for righteousness, for peace. We unite ourselves with all those who choose this same path here in our congregation and in virtual and physical Christian communities all over the world, but also with those faithful citizens of God's kingdom who have gone before us. This week we marked the second anniversary of the terrorist attack on Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, which killed 11 people at Sabbath prayer and injured six more. The rabbi of that congregation has a particular relationship with the pastor of Emmanuel African American, African Epis I'm gonna try again. The pastor of Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, a church lovingly known as Mother Emanuel. This church is where a terrorist killed nine people, including the senior pastor, during a Bible study in June of 2015. These American citizens, citizens of the kingdom of God, killed while practicing their faith as children of God, are among those I see today in the communion of saints. We remember, especially in a moment when we gather at the table, we remember countless believers who lived their lives in faith, seeking however imperfectly to live into these beatitudes, to be close to God, to walk the way of Jesus, making peace, seeking righteousness, showing mercy and humility. Some of them we remember by name, either because they're famous, Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr., or because they personally touched our lives, members of this church and members of our family, neighbors and friends. This is the day we underline the sentence in the creed that says, 
I believe in the communion of saints. The day that we share this sacrament, imagining not just these pews filled to overflowing, but overshadowed by a cloud of millions more who share our faith and cheer us on, especially when the way feels lonely, and even when we are tempted to put our trust in some human institution not worthy of that trust, and even when we long for a way that is more comfortable and rewarding. Because they are there. We're not alone. We're not alone. Whether the election turns out the way you want or not, whether the worst comes to pass in violence or disinformation or any number of other terrible things we may not have thought of, no matter what, our citizenship is sure. The power of the faith we share, power in meekness and mercy and humility and always seeking what's right, that power is rock solid. The road may not be easy, but it is the right road. We are called blessed. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able and let us confess the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. God is the author of creation. God created the world and God created us. We often hear people say, I am a self-made man or woman. Such people acknowledge themselves as their own creator. This morning we acknowledge God as the creator. We worship not ourselves, but God who created us. Our stewardship of time abilities, and money acknowledges that God created all of us. We are grateful for your faithful living and generous giving. Generous God, when giving becomes difficult, help us to remember that you gave your only son. When promising becomes difficult, help us to remember that we are promised life in abundance. Help us to give beyond what our hearts and minds allow. Amen. We turn now to the sacrament of Holy Communion. You at home may use elements that you have prepared there. Uh, those who are with us here, if you did not pick up your self-serve sanitary communion, feel free to do that as we, uh, as we begin here. This table, every time we gather, offers an act of holy imagination to imagine something beyond what we see and partake of here. And today, more than ever, we imagine 
all those of whom we are a part in the body of Christ. Those still among us, whether they're here in this sanctuary or out in cyberspace, and those who have gone on. We sometimes speak of the church militant, the church on earth, fighting the good fight to live in faith, and the church triumphant, the church universal, the church eternal. At this table, we are all one. So let your imagination uh, flow to whatever, whatever kind of massive table you imagine in a beautiful place with, with plenty of food. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who find refuge in God. We will begin with prayer requests that have been submitted this morning. Two saints of this congregation died just this past week. So we remember in prayer the family of David Sponseller and the family of Rita Roth. Also for Sue Calvert, who is in vulnerable health, for Karen Parker, who is dealing with back pain, for all in our community and our congregation who are isolated and struggling because of the pandemic, for the grandson of a friend who is in the hospital with COVID, for the family, friends, and co-workers of Justin Reber, age 39, who died yesterday from COVID-19 here in Evansville, prayers for health workers, prayers of thanksgiving for a wonderful sermon, prayers of celebration for the birthday of three saints close to me, my daughters Abigail, Joanna, and Lydia, who are celebrating their birthday worshiping on the couch. Surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, we pray for the fulfillment of God's promise. As we lift up those named here, O God, Strengthen us to run the race that is before us, laying aside the heavy burdens of sin and death, and following Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Gathered now at the Lord's table, let us offer our prayers of thanksgiving. Thanks and praise to you, O God, creator and lover of the universe. You created all that was, you nurture all that is, and you imagine all that will be. You are the pattern of community, three in one, God of mercy. From the beginning of time, you have created us for relationship with one another, with the earth, and with you. And when we reject your call to community, choosing isolation over partnership, choosing brokenness over healing, you call us back again and again and again with words of grace and the promise of new life. We are so grateful to remember that we are not alone at this table, but we join our voices with all the saints whom you have called, giving thanks for Jesus Christ, who is both our host and our guest at this table. Through his life, you took on flesh, affirming the goodness of our bodies and our world. Through him, you took on suffering, sharing the truth of hope in desperation. Through his death, you took on death, revealing the depth of your love for us. And through his resurrection, you brought new creation, embodying the promise of everlasting life. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and cup, gifts of the earth through which you bless us, and offer ourselves in service. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, O God, and on these gifts of fruit and grain, that we may taste your goodness, see your presence, become one with you and your body. Gathered at your table, we join all your saints who have gone before us. We name in our hearts those special to us who we remember this day. And especially, O oh God, we give thanks for the life and witness of these members of our own congregation who have joined the church triumphant since this day last year. Ray Reynolds, June Coslett, Alan Winslow, Eleanor Height, Larry Arp, 
Patricia Norvell, David Sponseller, Rita Roth. In life and in death, we belong to you, our Alpha and Omega. All thanks and praise to you, O God, holy, three in one, now and forever. Amen. And with the confidence of the children of God that we surely are, we join our hearts and voices in the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. According to the tradition that we have received, on the night that he would be betrayed, Jesus shared a meal with his friends, and when they had given thanks as we have done, he took the bread and broke it. He gave it to them and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this, remember me. In the same way, he took the cup. He gave it to them and said, this is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Remember me. And we remember Paul's instruction, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Surely these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We who have been fed and nourished at this table, strengthened in faith to live lives of faithfulness, will you join me in the printed prayer after communion? Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal kingdom. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.
staff who is so beautifully managing and leading this congregation in Kevin's absence, Robert and Laura and Jerusha and Carolyn. Thanks to all these musicians and to John for a wonderful time of worship. And now go from this time into the life of faith to which we are called, knowing that you are blessed. The grace of Christ Jesus, the love of God, the communion and companionship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.